بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I am honored and delighted to be back at the YMA after a short trip that I had taken to the Middle East, particularly to Iran and Iraq, where I had the chance and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to visit the shrine of our beloved Imams, Al-Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha alayhi salam in Iran, in Mashhad. Shukran. The, and in Iraq, I visited the shrine of our beloved Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Najaf al-Ashraf. In Karbala, I had the chance to visit our beloved Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. In Baghdad, I had the chance to visit the two Imams, alayhim salam Al-Imam Al-Kadhim and Al-Imam Al-Jawad, the seventh and ninth Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And in Samarra, I had the chance to visit Al-Imam Al-Hadi, alayhim salam and Al-Imam Al-Askari, the tenth and the eleventh Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam I prayed for all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. And you are in my, in my mind and in my heart. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would grant us the chance to visit the shrine of our beloved Imams, inshallah, sometime soon. The topic for tonight is building the community. There is a very telling hadith, a powerful, powerful hadith. That says when Ibrahim السلام, finished building the Kaaba, he stood on the side watching the Kaaba, the erected Kaaba. He was so elated and he felt a sense of honor and jubilation. And he kept on looking at the Kaaba that he built. He achieved something great. Allah was the architect and he was the builder and the Kaaba was the building. As he was looking on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel. He asked him, he asked him, قَالَ يَا Ibrahim. Are you so excited? Are you so happy? He said, of course. It's an honor. It's an honor for me to build the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else had this honor. Only me and my son Ismail. So of course, I am delighted. I am happy. I am excited that Allah had honored me with that task building his house. So of course I'm so jubilant. I'm so happy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Ibrahim, قَالَ يَا Ibrahim, Why are you so excited for? هَلْ أَشْبَعْتَ جَائِعًا Did you feed hungry? هَلْ كَسَوْتَ عُرْيَانًا Did you offer a piece of Clothing to a naked person? Did you offer a shelter to someone, to a homeless? You build a building. Big deal. Anyone can do that. Ibrahim paused for a second and he thought with himself. All this time I was so happy. I thought I did something that no one else can do. But I realize there are things that are more important in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than even building the Kaaba. 
to feed the hungry, to give a piece of cloth to a naked person, to offer a shelter to a homeless. It seems that these things are more important in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever since he decided not to eat by himself. Every time he sits to dine, he asks his slave or his servant to go out and seek someone, a stranger, a wayfarer, someone who has no family. At the time where there were no restaurants, no hotels, people had wayfarer, strangers, passengers had no way to go. He tells his servant, go and look for any strange, for any stranger and bring him to me and have him dine with me, eat with me. When, you, when we read the history of our Holy Prophet and our Imams والسلام, it seems that reaching out to the community, fulfilling their needs, taking care of the poor, feeding the hungry, offering shelter to homeless, these were things that were in the top priorities of our Imams. Even though our Imams were busy teaching people, and teaching were a priority for them as well, but they never lost sight of their ultimate role in the community, that they are not only teachers, they are not only educators, rather they are community builders. There is a telling story from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was in his way in the middle of the night to the masjid to do some extra rak'at, when he sees a lady, a widow, with her son, with her orphan, and she was wearing, she was carrying a huge container of water that it seems she was overtaken by the weight of the container. Imam Ali approaches her without even disclosing his own identity. He would ask her if he can help her with the burden she was carrying. As he is taking the burden, the container to her house, he asks her about her situation. Who are you? She says, I'm an orphan. I'm, I am a widow, and I have a few orphans at home. And God would hold Ali ibn Abi Talib responsible. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was shocked. He says, why? What does Ali ibn Abi Talib have to do with this? She doesn't know that it is Ali ibn Abi Talib she's talking to. She says, because my husband got killed in the battle of Safin, and he forgot all about us. Imam Ali السلام, felt his heart is being squeezed out of its place. His tears were flowing on his cheek. And he continued his way to her house. When they arrived home, he told her, wait, I am going and I will be back soon. I will bring some wheat so I can bake some bread for you and for your orphans. She says, God bless you. You seem a very good man. You have such a good heart. The Imam goes, he comes back with a huge bag of wheat. And he tells the lady that he saw her children crying, weeping out of hunger. For a couple of days, they never had a good meal. And the Imam السلام, tells her, he says to her, either you take care of children and I bake the bread for you in the oven, or vice versa, you 
bake the bread and I will take care of your children. She says, no. I know how to handle my kids. I will be busy with my kids, with my orphans. You go ahead and bake the bread for us. So the imam came and he started baking the bread. As the fire was flaming in the oven, Imam Ali السلام, brought his face so close, so close to fire, till he felt the heat of fire on his cheek. Take it, taste the heat of fire for forgetting about this widow in your community. A few minutes later, her neighbor came in. She was shocked to see Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Imam of Muslims, the Khalifa of the time, the ruler of the country, he is at her house baking bread for her children. She went to her, rebuking her. She says, do you know who this guy is? She says, I don't know. He seems a good man though. He saw me in my way home and he took my, the water container, he helped me. He brought some wheat, he's taking care of my children. I don't know who he is. She says, ذَلِكَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. The woman, the widow was so shocked and terrified because she already criticized Ali ibn Abi Talib. She offended Ali ibn Abi Talib before Ali ibn Abi Talib without knowing it is him. She came hurrying to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib I'm so embarrassed from you, Ya Amir al Mu'minin. I'm so embarrassed of you. How did I forget about you? How I would go home and sleep and enjoy my sleep and enjoy my meal while there are people, women like you in my community who cannot afford one decent meal. I am so embarrassed of you. Do not apologize, apologize to me. I shall apologize to you. My dear brothers and sisters, what really prompted me to choose this topic, building the community, reaching out to the needy. There are many hadith indeed about this. Many hadith. One hadith, one short hadith, the Prophet sallallahu says, Anfa'u nas I'm, I'm sorry, khayrun nas the best person in the eyes of Allah. Who? Who is the best person in the eyes of Allah? The one who prays more? No. The one who fasts more? No. The one who has went to hajj more? No. The one who has a long beard? No. The hadith says, Af an afdalun, khayrun nas. The best person in the eyes of Allah, anfa'ahum lin nas. The one who helps people the most. That is the best person in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one hadith. Another hadith. Dawood, King David, he was a prophet as well. In addition of being a prophet, uh, king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him that, Ya Dawood, if one of my people, one Muslim, would do one particular hasana, I am willing to take him to heaven, to paradise for that particular hasana. One hasana would be enough for him to enter. What kind of hasana I have to do? What kind of hasana that is that if someone does it, it would be enough for him to enter paradise? To 
take care of the calamity of a person who is in trouble. To take care of the depression of someone depressed. If you do that, it may in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be equivalent to all the prayers you have done. Maybe 100,000 prayers. <clears throat> 70 years of fasting. 16, 17, 20 times of Hajj, going to Hajj. It's one Hassan. You take care of someone in trouble. You dispel the distress of someone who is distressed. What prompted me to choose this topic is my last trip to Iraq, my dear brothers and sisters. I mentioned to some friends that if someone, if one of you is interested in getting depressed for three months, go to Iraq. Go and see the situation on the ground. People who lack the most basic services, of the 24 hours, there are three hours of electricity. In an oil-rich country, there is no oil, no gas. You have to wait for about two hours in long lines in order to get some gas. In many areas in Iraq, no security. People leave homes and they bid farewell to each other. They don't know if they will be coming home safe or not. But in addition to all these scenes that I saw in Iraq, one was the most striking one, the most depressing one, the most heartbreaking one, was the scene of thousands of orphans who have no one to take care of them. Virtually they have no one to take care of them. According to the UNICEF, Iraq has the largest number of orphans in the world, according to its population. Of 26 million people who are Iraq's population, there are 5 million orphans. 5 million orphans, 1 million widows. Yesterday, a distressed, depressed lady came to me in my office. She was going through a lot with her husband, who seems to be abusive. She said, Sayyid, I don't want to seek divorce because I have kids. But I don't know what to do with my situation. My husband is abusive. He neglects me. He doesn't take care of me. I didn't come to you to seek divorce. I came to you to say a few words to me just to calm my heart. I'm going through a lot. I need some assuring words from you. I said, sister, if you go to Iraq, you come back home, you will be so happy and content. She says, how? I say, now you have a husband, you have children, right? You may have difficulties with your husband, but you have healthy kids. When it is time, to feed your kids, you have something to feed with them. You have some food to put on their table, right? She says, yes. And I said, when it's time to go and rest, you have a bed where you can put your head on and you can sleep safe and sound. Go to Iraq, you see mothers with five orphans, seven orphans, nine orphans. They have no one to take care of them. They have virtually no one to take care of them. No government to pay them anything. They don't have jobs. There is no social security department. There is no welfare depart department. If they are lucky, they will get stuck with someone. They were run by someone who would give them some charity, some alms. You know, in the orphanage that my father built, there are 400 400 orphans. However, I realized in this, in this trip, that the orphanage is taking care of not 400 orphans, 
4,400 orphans. 400 orphans, those who live in the orphanage, those who are directly taken care of by the orphanage. But there are 4,000 other orphans who could not find their place at the orphanage because it was at its full capacity. They would stay at their relatives' homes, but they get stipend from the orphanage. $50 each. $50 for each orphan per month. In a very expensive time. Very expensive time. My dear brothers and sisters, when I was in Iraq watching these orphans, watching these widows who would come and shed their face, they had to beg others. You know, there is no, nothing more precious to the human being than his face, than his reputation. Many people, many people choose to to stay poor, hungry, rather than asking other people, rather than begging, because to them, their face is more precious. But often it gets to the point that people have no choice to, but to beg. They have no choice but to extend the hand of begging to others. People who used to be giving in the past, now they became receiving. People who had their own livelihood in the past, now they are being tried. And my dear brothers and sisters, I tell you something, keep it in your mind, that we all can be subject to these kind of trials. We all. Look at Japan. The most sophisticated and wealthiest country on earth. The per capita income in, in Japan is the highest. Now that I'm talking to you, there are at least two million people who are all wealthy, doctors, lawyers, businessmen and women. They all became homeless. They all became homeless. They have no home to stay at. They are spending their nights at the shelter, at the public shelter. Where? This is not in Nigeria. This is not in Somalia. This is not in Bangladesh. This is in Japan, one of the most sophisticated and wealthiest countries on earth. In a matter of seconds, someone who was so wealthy became poor. Someone who had the most beautiful mansion, it was wiped out. Someone who had a huge building, it's gone. In a matter of seconds, an earthquake, an earthquake. There were no wars, no diseases. An earthquake that took place for less than one minute. It turned the life of millions of people upside down. What does this tell you? This tells you that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to try us, He doesn't need much. He doesn't need to send tomahawk muscles, muscles, missiles to bomb us. He does not need to send an army to wipe us all or to annihilate us. It takes one <coughs> flood like Katrina or it takes one, God forbid, one earthquake like the one took place in Japan or in Haiti last year. That's all. We are all subject to trials. So no one can say I'm immune. It can happen overnight. However, my dear brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to lead you to is this, that the Prophet وسلم, in his khutbah, in which he was welcoming the month of Ramadan, and we always mention that khutbah every year at the time when Ramadan comes, he says, وَتَرَحَّمُوا وَتَرَحَّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَيْتَامِ النَّاسِ يُتَرَحَّمْ عَلَىٰ أَوْ أَيْتَامِكُمْ Be nice to other orphans. So maybe, maybe if my children become orphans, someone will take care of mine. It is so important, my dear brothers and sisters, that 
we do not limit our understanding of religion only to praying the Subh and Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Asha. We do not limit our execution of our Islamic practice only to going to Hajj. Rather, to seek those who have dignity, but their dignity impeded them from seeking help. Go and look for them. You don't even need to go to Iraq, here, in our midst, in this community. We have needy families. We have families who cannot afford good meals. Ask Hajj Najah, she has been, God bless her, she is busy, she's been busy taking care of these families. We always assume false assumptions that since we live in the United States, everybody is, is wealthy, everybody is content with their you know, income, there is no need. That's not true. That's not true at all. There are many families here, right in Dirwan, in the heart of Dirwan community, who cannot afford one decent meal for one reason or another. When the head of the household is taken to the jail, whether for the right reason or the wrong reason, who is going to pay the price? The family, the wife and the children. So what would happen when there is no one looking after the family? The family will fall apart. And then it will be our responsibility. It will be our responsibility. The Prophet wasallam says to, the, to his companions one day that when you cook, you know, the fragrance of your cooking will, will transpire to, the, to, the, to your neighbors. If your neighbors smell the good fragrance of your food and they happen to be poor, إِذَا شَمَّ جَارُكَ رَائِحَةَ الطَّعَامِ you're hurting him. This is not an Islamic mannerism. To let your neighbor smell the food you're cooking, yet he is unable to have this kind of food. He's hungry. Then the Prophet says, He will be a liar. He who says that he believes in me. من بات شبعانا وجاره جاء. He will be liar. He who says that he believes in me, he sleeps full while his neighbor sleeps hungry. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you see how our religion builds the community. When you build the community, you need to have everyone involved. You need all hands to be working together. I cannot say I am fine, alhamdulillah, I'm fine. I came to this country, I established myself, I have nice livelihood, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah wa shukur. You can say that, but that's not enough. You cannot only think about yourself. You need to think about others. You need to think about other Muslims, other needy people. And you need to ask yourself, what can I do for them? We always ask others what they can do for us. Always. Because we all have this sense of selfishness. We want others to help us, but we rarely want to help. We want others to check on us, ask about us, reach out to us, but we rarely reach out to any, to ask about any. My dear brothers and sisters, Islam tells us this is a selfish attitude to expect others to ask about us, to do good for us, but we rarely ask others. What's wrong with them? And I conclude with this. When it is time for salah, there are two ways to perform your salah. One is to go to your bedroom or your family room and pray, dhuhr and asr. However, it is very recommended that if you live not too far from the masjid, you come to the masjid and pray the same prayer 
jama'ah congregationally. The hadith says only, only Allah knows the reward of the jama'ah. Only Allah. How many hasana? One million? Well, if it was one million, I can know that. You can know that. It is not something we cannot fathom. The hadith says the reward. No one can fathom the reward of the jama'ah. So if it's one million or two million, you and I can fathom that. It must be something beyond these digits that you cannot fathom. Allah only knows and fathoms. Now, what's the difference? A prayer is a prayer. You pray at your living room, your family room, in your bedroom, or you, live, you pray it congregationally in the masjid. Why? When you come to the masjid, you see a fellow Muslim. You have to ask him, how is he doing? Is he okay or not? You will turn your face right and left, and you will be, in, inevitably, you will be checking on your Muslim brothers and sisters. You will shake hand with them. If you see him depressed, you will ask him, what's wrong with you? If you see him distressed, you will ask him, what's going on? What can I do for you? Now we understand why it is so important to come to the masjid and do Salat al-Jama'ah. Because this will give the opportunity to the community to check one on another. On another. To reach out to others. To find out what is, going in the, what is going on in the community. The Prophet had the tradition of checking on Muslims. If someone doesn't show up for a few days, the Prophet asked about him. What is he? Why is he not showing up? Something wrong with him? If he's okay, he's okay. If he's in trouble, the Prophet would go and visit him. We check on him. We need to restore this akhlaq. We need to restore the tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in our community. Allahumma gfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat innaka qadhi al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir wa ila arwah al-mu'minina wal mu'minat naqra' surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha السلام عليكم ورحمة الله